Saturday afternoon and evening, Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles at Israel, marking the first time that Iran has ever launched a direct military assault on the Holy Land. Well, it brings up many questions. Will the Israel-Iran conflict lead to World War III? Is it time for World War III? Will Israel or Iran be destroyed in World War III? Well, we'll go to the Bible for the answers to many of these questions and much more on this edition of The End Time Show. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries. I do thank you for joining me on this edition of the End Time Show. And, you know, what we want to do here at End Time Ministries, obviously we're teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God because the end time is now. Well, we use current events to show you how those prophecies written 2,000 to 2,500 years ago are coming to pass as we speak, letting you know that we're just prior to the time when Jesus Christ will come to get His church have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the sky, and go straight to fight on behalf of Israel at the Battle of Armageddon, and that's when he establishes his kingdom here on the earth. Today I want to go through one of those because World War III is one of the events that will occur just prior to, in the years leading up to, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to look at this scenario that happened over the weekend from a couple different perspectives because I know what you're being taught in the news but there's a little twist that I found an article in Israel 365 news there's a there may be a little twist on this and I want you to know about that as well so we're going to look at it from a couple different angles here because certainly this scenario could lead to I say could lead to. Can I guarantee you? No, I cannot. But it certainly could lead to a World War III scenario, and we want to take a look at it here today from a couple different perspectives. You know, I was up at Jim Baker, me and Doug and Vince were up at Jim Baker's ministry this weekend. Um, me and Doug taught at the uh, this Ready Now, Ready conference that they had, Ready Now Expo. And I had just got off a um, one of their shows that I was on, one of the seminars, and I had just talked to them about World War III and this World War III scenario and walked them through it. And when we got off the air, we're standing there watching some other people talk. And Jim Baker, uh, well, we were watching our phones, number one, we were following it, but Jim Baker called into Ricky. He said, Ricky, is, they called me Reverend Dave. So they said, is Reverend Dave still there? And I said, and he said, yeah, he's standing right here. He said, I got to talk to him. We got on the phone. We talked about different scenarios. And he said, look, I don't care what's going on at the ministry. You need to get up there and go live and tell them what's going on. Have them pray for Israel. So me and Ricky got back up there and did a, a, a live break, breaking news segment. And it, and it was awesome. But what happened? Well, many of you know now that Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles at Israel on Saturday, from, and they launched them from Iran and the locations of their regional proxies in, in an attack that really, if, if you look at it, let's say, you know, maybe days or weeks down the road, it could lead to a major escalation between these regional arch enemies. And while a majority of those launches that were intercepted by the IDF, it was the United States that tipped off Israel to the attack once it began. United States forces were also responsible for the shooting down of, I think it was 80 of the UAVs, which are um, unmanned aerial vehicles, and at least six of the ballistic missiles, according to uh, U.S. CENTCOM. So dozens of other launches were also intercepted by the U.K., France, Jordan, uh, and we know now um, that uh, Saudi Arabia was even in on some of it because they were flying across their airspace and they were work, working under a regional defense umbrella that was recently established by Washington. So in light of all of this, there's many dynamics and scenarios that are playing out 
The Bible says the United States or the, the eagle is going to protect Israel against the world governing body in the end time. Here we see, even though Joe Biden has lifted sanctions, allowing Iran billions of dollars to flow into their coffers, which could possibly have funded this attack, still though, when it, when, when it come down to crunch time and Israel was getting attacked, the United States stepped up and stood on behalf of Israel. Very prophetic, I want you to know that. In the face of what, whatever Washington's mindset is, we are still gonna stand with Israel. So, we're gonna get deep off into some of these scenarios, uh, but first let me mention First Cup Coffee. As you can imagine, we are essentially working around the clock to keep up with the news. Certainly, we're energized and motivated by our God-given purpose. Thankfully, we're also being fueled by First Cup Coffee. I mean, they're a Christian-owned Patriot Coffee Company out of the great state of Texas. There are many different roasts for you to choose from. Go to firstcup.com, use code ENDTIME to get 10% off. If you subscribe, they'll give you an additional 10% off. So go to firstcup.com, use code ENDTIME to get 10% off today. Now, the attack that happened on, it was like Saturday, Saturday evening into Sunday morning, depending if you were overseas or here. This attack, again, like I said, it marks the first time. That, so everything's, just, the, the situation's totally changed here from what was going on. It's the first time that Iran has ever launched a direct military assault on Israel. And Iran said the attack was in response to this um, suspect, suspected Israeli strike on an Iranian um, diplomatic building in Syria, that consulate that's up there that was back in April. But we know it's much more than that. Iran is religiously bound to destroy Israel and the United States. So up until this time, Iran had been using its terrorist proxies, Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis down in Yemen, to attack Israel. But not this time. The equation has certainly changed dramatically. Now it's head-to-head -head with Iran and Israel. And a lot of things were learned by Israel over the weekend, and a lot of things were learned by Iran over the weekend. And the Times of Israel, of course, they reported that in an unsourced report that on Channel 12, they claimed that the War Cabinet has now decided to hit back clearly and forcefully against Iran with a response that's designed to send the message that, hey, Israel's not going to allow an attack of that magnitude again against it to go to, to pass without a reaction. Iran warned any retaliation by Israel would lead to decisive and much stronger response. Now, excuse me, I'm fighting my allergies today. But the, I found an article because a lot of people said, well, hey, this is just Iran. Think, you got to think this scenario out. I've been thinking about this. Iran launches these unmanned aerial vehicles and these missiles and different things, but Israel had hours to prepare. Why would Iran do that? I mean, why not just launch them from Hezbollah in the north, where, I, where Israel has no time to prepare, and, you know, why not? If you're going to try to launch a war here, why not fire them from Hezbollah, what's left of Hamas, from the Houthis, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad from Iraq and Syria, why not launch them all at the same time? And you got to wonder, why would Iran launch them from all the way on the other side of Iraq and Saudi Arabia to take up to five hours to get there? I, Israel knows they're coming. Great Britain, Jordan, the United States, Israel, they're all waiting on these things to get there. And when they come, they just pick them out of the air. We took out 99% of them. So you got to sit here and wonder, not too smart on Iran's part, right? But was it? This was not Iran's actual attack, said Israel 365 News. The article says um, this was the attack prearranged for show between Iran and the Biden administration through back channels. It's an attack that will allow Iran to show off that it can reach Israel. And if you remember seeing some of the videos where 
some of the um, drones were right over, almost, they were really close to the Temple Mount. Well, why in the world would they do that? Well, they say that it, they wanted to show Israel that we can reach that area, but not inflict any real damage if we want to. They're just showing them, and the Biden administration has already made it clear that it will oppose any Israel response, and there will be public condemnations and warnings about escalating the conflict further. So Iran, they're sitting here, this is a, this is a fact-finding mission. They're finding out what's going to be Israel's response. What happens if we need to launch things that take hours to get there? Well, we can't do that. We need to fire stuff off from Hezbollah. And look, we want to see what the response of Israel is going to be. We want to see what the response of the United States and all the European nations and other uh, Sunni Arab nations. What, what's going to be their response? How is Jordan going to react? Okay, so it's a fa it, many, there are people speculating that it could have been a fact-finding mission for Iran. So, does it mean it's over? The article says no. Iran did burn up some resources and some and uh, defenses. They did what they were supposed to do. They are understanding what uh, Israel's really trying to do here. But it says, however, Iran actually um, had Iran actually been trying to launch a serious attack, it would have done it through Hezbollah, the Houthis, the Iraqi, and whatever is left of the Hamas proxies. Think about that. I thought about. I, I read this article and I'm like. Man, that's true. And why? Because it gave, what, with this launch of these unmanned aerial vehicles and things, it gave, it, out, Israel knew hours in advance that they were on the way. There was no element of surprise at all. And so if you know anything about war, one of the number one things you want is the element of surprise. So it says that Hamas's October 7 attack planned by the Iranian IRGC, which is supposedly the ones that launched these drones and missiles, that um, the, the general who was killed is in, a, in an alleged Israeli strike in Damascus back on April 1, that he analyzed Israel border and air defenses, its infrastructure and command and control in search of a weakness to exploit, and he did so effectively. And that is what a serious direct Iranian attack would have done. It would have attacked that weakness, not what it did the other night. So they say, the question is, what's, what's Iran going to do next? Well, Iran's not currently ready for a regional war, perhaps they say, to use its proxies to do its dirty work, that they'll continue to do that. But here's the thing I wanted you to hear. Iran will do things beyond this light show, they say, which is largely meant to reassure the Biden administration that it's diplomatic tools, because Biden's thinking, hey, we've lifted sanctions, we've given them billions of dollars, and this is working. But that's all a ruse. It's saying that they have largely meant to reassure the Biden administration that its diplomatic tools have successfully solved the problem, and that an illusion, it's an illusion that Iran has used um, to allow it to build up its nuclear weapons program to sow dragon's teeth around the region and to cut off international shipping as well. So you can see what's going on here. They had this, the, this guy, whoever that wrote the article, the guy's name is Daniel Greenfield, he's writing that this was, a, this was merely a fact-finding mission for Iran. And once they get nuclear weapons, where do we launch them from? How will, will Israel think it's just another drone missile attack? Will, how will the United States respond? How will Israel and Jordan and everybody in the region respond? They're finding that out by doing things they just did over the weekend. Okay? So there's a lot of different ways to look at all of this. Now, I'm following this thing. I'm reading everything I can get my hands on. I've got people sending me articles like you cannot imagine from Israel and everywhere else. Why am I looking at this so closely? And this is why we should be concerned about this. Because... This certainly could lead to what the Bible calls the sixth trumpet war. The Bible prophesies that there will be a third world war. Revelation 9, verse 15, in the New Living Translation, says this. Then the four angels, who had been bound for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, were turned loose to kill one-third of all the people on the earth. The Bible says that this will originate 
in the Euphrates River region, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. So we've got to watch that. I know Iran is religiously bound to destroy uh, Israel. What are they trying to do? I'm sitting here looking at the whole thing. What are they really trying to do? They know that the United States could wipe Iran off the face of the planet. So they know they've only really got one shot at getting to Israel. And it, according to this article in Israel 365, the title is, This Was Not Iran's Actual Attack. It's a fact-finding mission. They're, they're playing, it looks like from this article, that they're playing the Biden administration and everybody else saying, well, look at what we did. That's pretty much all we can do. No. The, it appears from this article that they may be playing the Biden administration and everybody else dragging them along, kicking the can down the road until they can get their nuclear weapon created. So the Bible says, Loose the four angels bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels have been prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year to kill one-third of the people on all the earth. When those four angels are loosed, you know, it's shocking to read that this, may, this many people are going to die in this future war. The Bible says it's going to happen, though. The King James Version of this passage says to slay the third part of men. The New King James Version says to kill a third of mankind. The Good News Translation says to kill a third of the human race. And if you check 15 to 20 different translations, they all correctly conclude that this is exactly what this passage said. One third of humanity is going to die. Now, I will tell you, I'm not happy and gleefully talking to you about this today. I wish this was never even going to happen. I'm not trying to scare you into anything. I, I'm just telling you this war is coming. I talked to my chiropractor this morning about it, and he said, well, how are you preparing? Are you storing up food? Are you getting all this stuff done? And I said, yeah, I've got some food stored up. Uh, I do some things like that, but I'm not going to bury myself in a hole somewhere because we've got to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God to this entire world. You can't do that buried away in some cave somewhere hiding from everybody. Number one, there's really no place to hide from anybody anymore. With all the technology they have, you can forget that. I mean, you know, some people may think, well, I'll wrap myself in aluminum foil and, you know, no, come on. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that do I believe there's a God? Yes, I do. Do I believe he can keep me out of certain situations in the future? Yes, I do. I'm not taking, a lot of people that get scared out of their mind, they're taking God out of the equation. You say, but yeah, Dave, you guys believe in a post-trib rapture, and you believe that um, we're going to go through persecution. Yes, I do. But were the apostles scared to go through some persecution? No. The Bible says that they counted it all worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Look what Jesus did for us. But yet we think, well, I'm, 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 I'm going to float out of here on a cloud. I'm not going to have to be persecuted at all? Where do you see that in the history of Christianity? From, the, from, Act, from Acts chapter 2 on, from beyond Acts. The New Testament church, where do you see in the history of all of Christianity that Christians in the end are going to float out of here on a cloud and nobody's going to be persecuted? That's nowhere in the Bible. The Bible does say we're not appointed under the wrath of God, but that's where you need to understand. The wrath of God is not the great tribulation. That's the wrath of Satan. You say, Dave, you actually sound almost gleefully, uh, joyfully about this. I'm not, joy nobody wants to go through persecution, but I'm not going to be scared to the point where I'm put in a jail cell in my mind where I can't go out and reach into Satan's kingdom and pull people out of that and put them in God's kingdom. So you got we're going to have to get our mind right here and understand what's coming in the near future. So how do I prepare for World War III? I told, the, I told my chiropractor, I said, well, I'm trusting God. And he looked at me like, what? Trusting God? And I, I was like, that's how I live my life. I trust God. I do the best I can, and I let God do the rest. That's all you can do, folks, is do your best and let God take over the rest. There is no way. I know people may think they have all the answers, but there's no way that you're going to be able to prepare for every scenario that will happen in the future. Anybody that tells you they have every answer to every question, I'm, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. But God made it so that we would have to trust Him 
throughout these end times? I wish I had every answer, but I'm, I'm telling you right now, I don't. But I serve a God that does. That's the difference. And I know that God will be there with us. Folks, all of us, every single one of us, will have times in our lives when you don't have the answer. I wasn't even planning on talking about this today. But I feel we need to because we're talking about World War III and the things that are coming in the future. You don't have to go into the future scared out of your mind. If you're scared and have great anxiety about the end time, you don't have to have that. I live, I'm at the tip of the sword on this stuff. I'm on radio and television talking about it every day. But am I living scared to death? No, I'm not. Because I know that when I, all I have, all I can do as a finite human being is do my best. But when I come up to something where I don't have the answer for this, a situation in the future, I trust God. The Bible says, lean not onto your own understanding, but acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, and He will direct your paths. Why are those scriptures in the Bible? You ever ask yourself that? It's because you're going to come up against some things in this lifetime that you're not going to have the answer for. That's how it works. And you're going to have to rely upon, you'll either rely on yourself to try to figure it out, which, hey, we humans can make a big mess of stuff, can't we, sometimes? Or you're going to have to learn to rely upon God and be led by His Spirit. It's very, very, very critical. That's why a daily prayer life, a daily walk with God, studying the Word of God. The Bible says there's two ways you know God. The Bible says God is a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You need a daily prayer life and you need a daily diet of the Word of God. And when you bump up against a situation or a question you have in the future, some of these scenarios that will play out in the end time, we're going to trust God because it's designed so we won't have the answer to every question. Now, in the future, we may have the answer to that question, but right now, we may not. And so, I study this stuff. I understand the prophecies of the Bible, the vast majority of them, but it's designed. The Bible says, now we see through a glass darkly, but when that which is perfect is come, then we will know. So, this, when I live in a finite body, there's times I'm not there. I promise you, there will be times when we go through some of these end time scenarios and when we need the answer to something, it will be there. Up until that time, we've got to trust God. And so that's where we're at. The Bible says, take no thought what you shall eat, drink, or wear. Your heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. And I've had some people say, well, hey, awesome. I'm just going to quit my job, go home and sit on the couch and God will provide for me. No, remember what I said, you've got to do your best and then rely upon the Lord. All you can do is your best. The Lord will take care of the rest of it. So you don't have to go into this end time scenario scared out of your mind. And man, I just felt like saying that because a lot of people are so twisted up in their thinking and there are people teaching prophecy, trying to scare people to death and oh, we're just going to be you know, cut asunder and this, that, and the other. The Bible says that at the time of the rapture, that the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, there will be people who are resisting the Antichrist that are Christians that will be alive and remain all the way till that trumpet sounds. The entire world is not going to be squished like a bug under the thumb of the Antichrist. Okay? So, we got to get out of fear mode as the church. Get out of fear mode, get into evangelism mode. That's what we're doing here. We're teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. If you're scared out of your mind, you're not even going to want to get out of bed in the morning. You're going to pull the covers back up over your head and say, I, I just can't face the world anymore. No, come on. The Bible says, greater is it that's he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm not worried about Satan. I'm a Holy Ghost filled minister, a man of God. I'm not worried about Satan and what he's doing in my life. Greater is he that's in me. I've got God living inside of me. I'm not worried about him. He needs to worry, be worried about me. Because the Bible says, upon this church, I will, upon this rock, I will build this, my church, and the gates of hell 
will not prevail against it. I'm going out every day teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, taking people out of Satan's kingdom and putting them in God's kingdom. The gates of hell cannot prevail against that. So you say, but Dave, I had a flat tire the other day. Come on. You knew those tires were bald, right? I mean, not everything that happens is Satan. Sometimes it's our own ignorant, uh, maybe we made a bad uh, choice or a bad, um, a, a, um, you know, a bad uh, decision. And it's not Satan's fault. We just made a bad decision. And sometimes you got to reap the consequences of that. So, man, we, we, you know, we gotta, if we got our mind right, we can go into these end times in evangelism mode. The Bible says um, during the time of the Antichrist that they that do know their God will be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. They that do know their God will be strong and do great exploits for God. But if you're scared and hiding in a foxhole, it doesn't work like that. So when I talk about World War III, yes, it will be a dire situation. I totally agree with that. Will there be a lot of people killed? Yes, there were. You say, Dave, it doesn't get any worse than that. I understand that. But when somebody is born again, God doesn't look at death the way we do. We're, that individual's asleep awaiting the resurrection day. And so my advice to you, be born again. Say, there you are trying to scare us. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm telling you, this is the reality of this life. God is coming back before very long to establish his kingdom here on the earth. And that will happen at the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. I've got to get ready for that. I know things will happen in between now and then, but God will be with you every step of the way. If you will turn your life over to him, and become a true Christian who's a follower of Christ. I'm telling you, it's the way to live in the end time. Follow God, be led by His Spirit, and He's gonna take us all the way through this stuff. With my hand in His hand, there's nothing for me to fear. God bless, we'll be right back. A voice spoke to me and said, I've got something I wanna show you. I was so sure God had talked to me and I was stunned by what I saw. A direct fulfillment of this over 2,500 year old prophecy. The United States will stand with Israel. Why haven't I ever seen this before? One third of humanity will die. What do these beasts symbolize? The lion, the bear, the leopard. The combined beast from Revelation 13 represents the end time government of the Antichrist. Understanding the end time. Now streaming on End Time Plus and available to order at endtime.com slash UET. Go to endtime.com slash UET or call 800 end time. What if you could understand Bible prophecy? Dave Robbins, the host of the End Time Show's TV and radio programs, is holding a free prophecy conference near you. Gain peace and understanding about what the Bible says concerning end time prophecy. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com slash events to see when Dave will be in a location near you. Welcome back, everybody. And, you know, the reason that we talk about the Iran, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and Hamas, and Israel, and all this stuff all the time, number one, it's time for World War III. On God's prophetic time clock, World War III, the Sixth Trumpet War, and the Israeli-Palestinian Peace Agreement, those are the next two things to be fulfilled on God's prophetic timeline. Also, the Bible tells us where World War III will begin. If you look in, um, in the Sixth Trumpet Prophecy, Revelation 9, 13 through 15, it says this. And the sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose those four angels, 
which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Pull out a map, pull it up on your computer, the Euphrates River. Look at where it's located in the Middle East. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, for to slay a third part of mankind. Now, the angels who are bound in the river Euphrates, they are spirits. The Bible tells us that angels are ministering spirits to us who are the heirs of salvation. But these four angels referred to in Revelation 9.14, they're not ministering angels, okay? They're part of the one-third of angels that who rebelled with Satan. They are evil spirits. We know they're evil spirits because they are bound. And when, but when they're loosed, their assignment is to kill one-third of the people on mankind. And what they will do is they will influence people in wars and people will succumb to that, okay? The scripture says there were four angels bound in the great river Euphrates. So have you ever wondered why the angels are even mentioned here? Why not just say there's going to be a war? Well, the, the Bible tells us that angels are spirits. And in the book of uh, Daniel, remember when Daniel was praying and fasting? I think it's Daniel 10. He's fasting and he's seeking God's face for 21 days. Well, when the angel finally showed up, he said, well, Daniel, I heard you the first day you prayed, but the prince of Persia, so I ran. The prince of Persia, back then, uh, today is modern day Persia, I ran. So he said, I, I heard you the first day, but the prince of Persia withstood me. Now I go to fight against the prince of Greece. These were spirits. Persia was ruling the world at the time. And the Grecian Empire came afterward and conquered the Media Persia Empire. Remember um, Nebuchadnezzar's vision? The head of gold, arms and breasts of silver, belly and thighs of brass. So, this is, so we're talking about ministering spirits here, these four angels bound in the great river Euphrates. Okay, we're going to get into that because um, the uh, Media Persia overtook the Babylonian Empire, uh, the night that Belshazzar um, was, had the impious feast and the handwriting on the wall. And you can see, you've seen pictures of, you know, people kind of having a, a picture of the party, of Belshazzar's party, and there was gold everywhere and gold goblets and all this stuff. Okay, I had to do something to tie into birch gold. You knew that, right? So let me mention birch gold real quick and then we'll take off here. You know, the world government enthusiasts, they want to impose digital currencies and digital IDs on their populations of the world, right? They can allow officials to prohibit you from purchasing certain products or easily freeze or seize part of your money. In essence, it would get governments and central banks more control over your finances. There are some concerned Americans that are diversifying their assets into physical gold with the help of the Birch Gold Group. If you want a physical asset held in a tax-sheltered retirement account, go to birchgold.com slash end time to get your free info kit on gold. Maybe you've got an IRA or a 401k from a previous employer gathering dust. Birch Gold can help you convert that into an IRA in gold. You don't pay a penny out of pocket. So go to birchgold.com slash end time and claim your free info kit on gold because if the digital currencies do become a reality for all, you may wish you had some gold to fall back on. Now, back to Daniel. So Daniel was praying, uh, but there were, he, he was setting things in motion in the spirit realm. The prince of Persia stopped the angel until Daniel overpowered them in his prayers. Now, don't go trying to overpower the four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates, because as sure as I'm sitting here talking to you, this prophecy is going to come to pass. Okay? You can pray all you want, but this is already played out, and God's already seen all this stuff play out. It's going to happen. I will never pray for one of the prophecies not to happen. Because it's, the Bible says, Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. These prophecies are going to happen. So I don't pray for them not to happen. I pray how to go through them and the answers to it and this, that, and the other. But they're going to happen, okay? And the angel then said that he would go fight the prince of Greece. This is Daniel 10, uh, 13, through, down through about 20 right in there. So according to this passage, it appears nations have their own angels. So now let's go back to the prophecy. 
four nations house the Euphrates River. It's Turkey, flows down through Syria, enters into the northern boundary of Iraq, empties into the Persian Gulf, which forms the border. The Euphrates and the Tigris River meet. That forms the last uh, 50, 60 mile border between Iraq and Iran. So, could the angels mentioned in Revelation 9, 13, could those be the four angels of the Euphrates, the angel of Turkey, angel of Syria, Iraq, and Iran? It certainly appears to make perfect sense, doesn't it? Well, 60 to 70% of the Euphrates River is in Iraq. And, we, of course, the United States has troops stationed, and they've had stationed there for years. And war has been raging up and down the Euphrates River almost continuously since America invaded Iraq back in 2003. So, if this war, where the Bible says World War III will occur, if it has not already begun, folks, it appears as if we, now, and I, did you hear what I said? If it has not already begun. You say, Dave, there you are trying to scare us again. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm saying, look at this prophecy and look what's going on over here. Iran just attacked Israel directly in the first time in all of history, folks. Okay? And this is, it's unprecedented. So if it has not already begun, it certainly appears as if we are on the brink of this great war happening. And because two billion people are prophesied to die due to this war, it's certainly doubtful that it's going to be contained in that area. I mean, it could spread all, it's going to spread all around the world. I think I did a, I wrote an article years ago, and I put in there the amount of people that were in the Middle East. I think all of the people, with all of the Sunni and the Shia Arab nations, including Israel, I think it was 450 to 500 million people. World War III, because we're at 8 billion, just over 8 billion population right now on the earth, you're talking 2.7 billion dead as a result of this next war. So it's certainly, if you killed everybody in the Middle East, which God forbid, and that's not going to happen because I know Israel's going to be here all the way through, and Iran is part of Ezekiel 38 that will come down against Israel to battle, to battle of Armageddon. Uh, Iran's modern-day Persia. Turkey is modern-day Togarma in Ezekiel 38. So I know that they're not going to be totally wiped out, but Iran's probably going to be certainly diminished on the world stage. So there's another scenario that I wanted to look at today with you because I'm following this so closely, and I've almost read so much about it that it started to get hazy because <laughs> I read so many articles over between Saturday and right now. I'm like, oh, man. But the Jerusalem Post, they published an article, Israel's Dilemma Over Iran is the Dispute Between October 6 and October 7. The October 6 Israel, because I was there, me and my wife, we had a tour group in Israel, started October 6 when everything was just happy, go lucky, we were just touring, everything was awesome. But October 7th is the morning when Hamas invaded. So the October 6 Israel would probably have led an attack like this virtually with no damage. They probably would have let it slide. But the October 7th Israel is not the same entity as the October 6th Israel. The October 7th Israel, which experienced Hamas and the killing of over 1,200 uh, people and the taking of probably 250, maybe 250-ish hostages, it's not the same Israel, you guys. The October 7th Israel knows that sending messages of weakness, it begets more insecurity. Which Israel are we going to see? That's the big question here, is will Israel retaliate? What will they do? Um, Israel, are they returning to the October 6th mindset? Or have they embraced the October 7th mentality? Of we can't show any weakness because if imagine what happens right now if Israel does not respond to what I rent to all of these um, drones and missiles and things that came from Iran over the weekend. Imagine if Israel doesn't respond to that. I mean, what happens to a bully on the schoolyard when he pushes you down 
and you don't do anything. I've been there. I've been on the schoolyard and I got pushed down. And you say, well, what'd you do, Dave? Well, we got called to the principal's office for fighting because I wasn't going to let anybody push me down. Now, I, you know, that was been uh, 45 years ago, but still, you, you get on the schoolyard and a bully pushes you down, and if you don't get up and do something, now you guys raise your kids however you want, but if you don't get up and do anything, what's he going to do? He's going to keep pestering you. Pester, pester, he's a bully. Well, that's Iran. Iran shoots all that stuff at Israel. What happens if Israel doesn't do anything? What do you think Iran's mindset's going to be? Israel's weak. They're not going to do anything. Even though they just, what just happened in Gaza. But it, Iran's going to think, well, look at us. We're big and bad, and they are not going to do anything to us. They'll do something to one of our terrorist proxies, but they're not going to do anything to us. What, what Israel are we going to see right now? Well, it looks like they've made up their mind because I, obviously they went up there and they hammered down on those generals and things up at that consulate up in Syria. But going after Iran directly, that's a whole other ball game. Now this is going to a whole other 10 levels. Because if Iran and, and Israel start going at loggerheads with each other, then that, there's the possibility of the United States, Russia, China, and when all that happens, that's World War III tomorrow morning. Okay? Now, speculation. Could this go away? Maybe Israel, uh, maybe they won't retaliate. I highly doubt that, but maybe they won't. I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm speculating right along with you. I'm, we're waiting. What's Israel going to do? That's the pressing question. It looms over the government. And as it, you know, it's grappling with the aftermath of this audacious Iranian assault early Sunday morning. The skies lit up with hundreds of suicide drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles. They're coming right towards Israel. What's the mindset? The Israel of October 6th would have contained the attack. Yes, certainly. Iron Dome and everything else. Why retaliate? Most of the missiles and drones were intercepted, except there was a girl who was tragically wounded by shrapnel, but there were no, you know, it was no major injuries, deaths, or damage to infrastructure. So that they say that the Israeli six Israel, they may have just said, you know what, let's let it go. But here's the thing: what's the Israel of October seven? going to do. The Israel that experienced what Hamas did down in Gaza, the attack when they attacked from air, land, and sea, and come in and helplessly killed and raped all kinds of people. What's the October 7 Israel going to do? We're going to find out before very long. They that understand what is taking place will instruct many. Except a man is born again, he can enter or see the kingdom of God. I don't care what label you've been given or what label you've given yourself, you are essential. You still matter. This is a journey, and when we get to the other side of that, that's where our prize is, that's where our reward is. Time is not going anywhere. Welcome back, everybody, and I'm going to go into, I'm going to talk to you about Ready Pantry real quick, and then we'll go into the Sixth Trumpet War. You know, as Americans, we want to believe that the grocery stores are always going to be there, and, you know, we got, we, but we saw a few years ago that these supply chains and things could quickly collapse. So we got to pray for the best and then prepare for the worst. What if you had a way that you could have an affordable supply of emergency food on hand? Well, there is. ReadyPantry.com slash end time. It offers these amazing 25-year shelf-stable foods, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and even dessert. And not to mention, it's just kind of a peace of mind that you get knowing that you've got some emergency food ready for anything. It just, you know, 
warm, boil some water, put it in there, and hey, you got some food. And it, because, I mean, here in Texas, sometimes if it rains hard, everybody storms a grocery store. It's going to be a storm. Well, what happens if World War III kicks off? I was with a guy up in, um, at Jim Baker's ministry over the weekend. He said when COVID hit, he had a warehouse full of this food, and it got wiped out in no time. And he said, I had a hard time getting food back for a while. Now, think about that. Even these uh, different um, shelf-stable food companies and different things, they ran out of food immediately. So now, you don't want to wait till then to try to get it. So Ready Pantry, it's an American-based company with all the products sourced here in America. You're not going to be disappointed. Many long-term food storage companies on the Internet, they're selling stuff that's been on their warehouse for years, their shelves for years. Ready Pantry does not do that. They give you the freshest products packaged within the last few months, and that's what's delivered to your door. Ready Pantry, they offer discounts up to 20% off of 3 to 12 month supplies. Go to readypantry.com slash endtime. Use code endtime to save an additional 10% off your order. You never pay any shipping on all your orders. And you can also stock your pantry with um, buy now but pay later options available at checkout by going to readypantry.com slash endtime. Now, one of the last things here I want to talk to you about, because you say, Dave, why are we talking about this right now? Well, okay, so the sixth trumpet war, I'll tell you it again, sixth angel sounded, four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, loosed the four angels bound in the great river Euphrates. Four angels were loosed, prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, kill a third part of mankind. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000,000. 000. I heard the number of them. So the location... We know, we know where, that's gonna, where it's going to be, and it's going to be um, right there. The Bible says, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, bound the great Euphrates. The Turkey, uh, the, um, the Euphrates River starts in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Okay, so let me go down to timing here. That's what I want to talk about. The timing, because when you get down to the seven trumpets, very, very important, from the Old Testament uh, prophets to Revelation chapter 22. God gave us a timeline of events spanning, um, you know, what, thousands of years here. And of those prophecies, the sixth trumpet is one of the next to be fulfilled, okay? Seven trumpets along with the seven seals and the seven vials, um, they make up the skeletal structure of the book of Revelation. So I want you to understand the sequence of the timing of end time events. Yeah. And according to scripture and history, the first trumpet equals uh, World War I. That's 1914 to 1918. Second trumpet, World War II, 1939 to 45. Now, these are 2,000-year-old prophecies, but look how they're clipping off here. 1914 to 1918, 39 to 45. The third trumpet, Chernobyl nuclear accident. That's uh, April 26, 1986. That's the year I graduated high school. So now here they are clipping off in my lifetime. The fourth trumpet, the speeding up of time and the process of globalization with the tearing down of the balloon wall, 1989, a year after I got married. The fifth trumpet with Iraq war with Saddam Hussein, 1991. Guess what's next? That's the first five trumpets in the book of Revelation. Guess what's next? The sixth trumpet war. Also, around the same time, an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement. Um... Or, or a two-state solution, and with many characteristics that go along with that. But I'm telling you, why are we talking about the Sixth Trumpet War? The first five trumpets in the book of Revelation, part of the skeletal, skeletal structure, have happened in just over the last, what, 110 years. The first five in 110 years. And they're clipping off. The last um, three, 86, 89, and 1991. 90, now here we are in 2024. This war is staring us right in the face. And then, of course, the seventh trump is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And, of course, we don't know the date of that. But you can see how this 2,000-year-old sequence of prophecies, this sequence of events, began to be fulfilled just over 100 years ago. And it's occurring very rapidly. And the sixth trumpet war, it occurs either just before or shortly after that peace agreement. Israel and the Palestinians. It's one of the next events to occur on God's prophetic timeline. And this is why we say, we're, if we're not re already in this war, man, it sure could happen at any time, couldn't it? And we also need to understand another perspective, which involves a parenthetical insertion. 
Revelation 10. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to go through this is because I read something from somebody the other night that said that the uh, Six Trumpet War, World War III, would not happen until after the, the Antichrist is revealed, until after the Great Tribulation. And I'm going, oh, I told my wife, I said, I can't read this stuff. And she was like, just settle down. If you know my wife, Jana, that's just our relationship. Settle down, it'll be all right. But I, I mean, I'm, I, want to, I want everybody to get this stuff right. So, there's this parenthetical chapter, Revelation 10, that's inserted in here. So there's a skeletal structure of the book of Revelation. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. And those... The book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. Those are several events that lead up to the second coming of Jesus Christ told many times over, over and over and over. But the, event, the seven seals are in order. The seven trumpets are in order. And the vials are in order themselves. And then those are sets of events. The, the, the seals, it's a very long story, leading to the second coming of Jesus Christ, which happens at the sixth and seventh seal. And it's a long story, very long, over a thousand years of the events started happening. The trumpets, just over the last 110 years, and they lead up to the seventh trumpet is the second coming of Jesus Christ, Battle of Armageddon. The seals, same way. They start immediately after the tribulation of those days, and they go to the seventh seal, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ, the battle of Armageddon, over again. So, you got to understand this, because when we get into the, um, the trumpets, they go from Revelation chapter 8 over to the end of Revelation chapter 11, but there is a parenthetical and explanatory chapter that is socked right in there with them. So they're going to happen, all of this, this account, the trumpet account, is going to happen in chronological order. So, when we talk about this, it lets me know that the World War III will happen absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt before the Great Tribulation. The Bible foretells the Six Trumpet War is going to happen before the Great Tribulation. How do I know that? The Great Tribulation begins three and a half years before the Battle of Armageddon and the Second Coming of Jesus Christ. Daniel 7.25, it tells us this explicitly. It says, the little horn, the Antichrist, will make war against the saints for time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. Revelation 13.5 says the same thing, but it says um, that power was given unto him, the Antichrist, to continue 40 and two months. And he makes war against the saints and prevails against them um, time, times, and half a time. From, and same thing, Daniel 7.25, it's referring to the same amount of time, 42 months, Revelation 13.5. Additionally, Revelation 12.6 says the dragon makes war against a woman for 1,260 days. It's all three and one half years. Matthew 24.15-21, Jesus describes the same amount of time. But let me see if I can get this to you in the time that I have left. It's very important because I, I read this the other night and I'm like, oh man, I got to describe this to everybody because the, the, the guy was saying World War III, he had to be saying World War III and the Battle of Armageddon, which is when he was describing that they're the same thing. They're not. They're two separate wars. World War III, the Six Trumpet War happens before the Great Tribulation. Battle of Armageddon at the end of the Great Tribulation. How do I know that? Because the scenario is in chronological order. The trumpets starts in Revelation chapter 8. You have the first trumpet, World War I. Go on down through there in Revelation. The, the, um, uh, the first four trumpets are in Revelation chapter 8. The fifth trumpet, Revelation chapter 9. Then Revelation 9, verse 13 through 21 is the sixth trumpet. That's World War III. Then you get to chapter 10. And it talks about that the angel stood on the land and on the sea and he raised up his hand to God, and he swore by him that lived forever and ever, and he declared that time should be no more, or that delay should be no longer. You've got to look in the different interpretations of the Bible, or the translations. So he's saying that, hey, this is a, there's a point in time in here there's going to be a shift. Things that, The delay shall be no longer. It's talking about going into the Great Tribulation. 
Now, this is in chronological order here. Then, when you go to Revelation chapter 11, which ends with the seventh trumpet, and because all this is in chronological order from 8 to the end of 11, when you go to the beginning, God tells John, measure the temple, but don't measure the outer court. It would be trodden down the Gentiles for 42 months. It's the same period as the Great Tribulation. And because what happens is you've got the sixth trumpet before the Great Tribulation. Then the angel in 10 says, delay should be no longer. We're going to move right off into the Great Tribulation. Same thing that happens in uh, Daniel chapter 12. And then you go into 11, and it talks about things that happened during the Great Tribulation. World War III has already occurred. And you talk about the, the sharing of the, of the uh, Temple Mount in the end time, which is one of the characteristics of the peace agreement that starts the final seven years. Then you have the two witnesses that have, they, they are, um, fulfill their ministry for three and one half years. And then they're killed. They lay in the streets for three and a half days. They're called up to heaven. Well, that's the rapture. The Bible says in that same hour, there was an earthquake and the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And that's when God comes back, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and we shall reign with Him. And that's the second coming of Jesus Christ, and then it talks about His wrath has come, which is the battle of Armageddon. So it's a chronological order here. Go from 8 all the way over into the end of chapter 11, and it gives you the chronological order. World War III happens before the Great Tribulation, not at the end of that. So why are we talking about this today? Because of what happened over the weekend, the escalation of what's going on, it, Iran is not going to go away. Iran is religiously bound in their mind to destroy Israel and to destroy the United States of America. Over the weekend, they just attacked Israel directly. So it's not going to go away. The world is waiting with bated breath to see what Israel, how they're going to retaliate. Depending on how they retaliate, it certainly could just blow up into a World War III scenario. I know that Biden is saying, we're not going to stand with Israel, but I can tell you right now, we did over the weekend, didn't we? We shot down many of those things coming in from Iran. So, Man, I'm following you guys with everything that, I mean, I'm just reading articles till my eyes are about to fall out, but these are the, there's different scenarios here going on. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that I'm trying to, I've got people sending me information from everywhere. If you get a good article, send it to drobbins at endtime.com. Maybe there's another perspective we haven't looked at, but one thing I do know, World War III is one of the next events on God's prophetic timeline.